I think the view with sleep is like you start off your life with sleep. You literally wake out of an unconscious state. So yeah. I think starting off there, like how are you going to function the rest of the day? What kind of day are you going to have? What kind of mindset are you going to have? Like we sort of all ask ourselves in the morning when we wake up, oh, how do I feel? Yeah. Right. And so I think being that guiding light is important in the beginning. Like, and if you can establish a frame of reference, like, hey, today's an awesome day. I'm going to go hit a PR today. I got, I actually did get first time in a while, some really good HRV last night and some good deep sleep. So like, I want to get to the gym. Like yes. I want to cancel a meeting or do something, you know, to, to get to the gym. But um, even more importantly, actually, if you didn't, like you're actually now on a little bit more guide of a foot. Okay. Yeah. For me, it's really important. I feel like when I know I have a bad night of sleep, more important that, okay, I'm going to watch out. All my hormones are off, right? My my Greenland is up, my leptin is down. I'm going to be eating crappier food that's going to make me feel even worse, right? I might make a bad judgment today. And more importantly, what am I going to do about it so I can get ready for tomorrow? That is Harpreet Rai, and this is episode 252 of Wellness Force Radio, where we discover the physical and emotional intelligence to live life well. In this episode, we're talking about why now more than ever in our modern industrialized world, how sleep beats food when it comes to fat loss, letting go of old weight, which is why it's on everyone's mind right now, the beginning of any year, this fat loss goal. We all know that right now, if you're listening to this on the first day of 2019 or any time, that sleep is incredibly important. And this content and the emerging science that we're talking about today on the show will be evergreen. It'll apply forever because let's face it, technology is not slowing down. There is not a day that goes by that someone's calendar or cell phone or appointments, responsibilities, bills, emails, notifications will ever go away in the future. I really enjoyed this podcast. I got to do this on video. There's a video on YouTube. So go to the Wellness Force YouTube and watch this in person. We have a ton of great content that was created from this dynamic conversation. But when I left this interview with Harpreet Rai, I had that kind of fun, giddy feeling. You know, like when you're a little kid playing in a sandbox and you're like, ah, that felt so good. That is exactly what I felt when I was done talking with Harpreet because I knew when we were done, I knew that this podcast was going to help so many people. In this moment, millions of people are focused on dieting and exercise. The first three letters of dieting, D-I-E, die. <laughs> every, time I, every time I do a diet or hear about a diet, I've felt this too. It's not about dieting. It's about living smarter with your wellness practices. Now, this unhealthy mindset that's perpetuated by the fitness industry specifically says, exercise more and eat less, exercise more and eat less. And it's complete bullshit. Because yes, there is some truth to that, a tiny bit. I've been using the Aura for two years myself, over two years actually. And I love this for a couple different reasons. Number one, they're not trying to make money off of people's insecurities. They're actually using this relationship to give people the greater capacity to let go of old weight. This is why this show is so important to me. And it's why we're starting out 2019 with this, because the importance of sleep, specifically sleep tracking, it's using the other side of the sword when it comes to technology to serve us. My opinion is this, without sleep, nothing else happens. You could eat really clean, you could work out, but if you do not sleep, this is when your body actually repairs itself. This is when you get stronger. This is when you lose weight, is in your sleep from all the things you've done during the day. But nature hates a vacuum. And if you're creating a big vacuum with not enough sleep and too much training and not enough healthy foods, your body is gonna hold on to that weight. And I can say this from my own experience, this understanding of the movement, the sleep, the food, they all play together. We're talking about circadian rhythm, latency feature, algorithms, artificial intelligence, how breath is being used and integrated in this new modern tech piece, the accuracy of wellness technology and wearables. Also, I'm stoked to tell you that this podcast is brought to you by my friends and your friends over at Organifi. They're doing some amazing work in 2019 with their new supplements around cognition and gut health. And I want to talk to you about this incredible new product they have called Pure. Now, this is a lion's mane infused gut and brain health product that has some of the most powerful adaptogens and digestive support superfoods in the world like lion's mane, aloe vera, baobab fruit, ginger root, digestive enzymes. It's got some incredible superfoods in there. I actually tried this product and I was blown away at how it felt. And I think you're going to feel the exact same way. We talk about getting more energy on this show without the use of excessive caffeine. This product, Pure, it's 100% vegan, organic, non-GMO, and there's no risk. I mean, give this thing a test drive for 30 days. If you don't like it, just ship it back. They'll give you a full refund. Oh, and you also get 20% off because you're here with us on Wellness Force. Just go to Organifi.com forward slash Wellness Force, enter code Wellness Force to get that big discount 
20% off for literally just a few bucks a day. Get the Organifi Pure so you can have more mental focus and a healthier brain to gut connection. Now, before we get into the show, I wanna let you know the exciting news. You're obviously going to enter to win this free Aura Ring. We're selecting one lucky winner to receive a brand new Aura Ring delivered right to their house. You can utilize this power of sleep and wellness tracking to really learn about yourself, how you can let go of the weight this year once and for all. To enter to win, just follow Aura Ring and Wellness Force on Instagram. Like the post that'll be pinned to the top. You'll know exactly the post it is when you go to Instagram. And you can do this. Tag a friend or family member or a coworker who gets to win this ring so that they can have less weight, more energy, and better sleep in 2019. And you get unlimited entries. Just tag as many people as you want in separate comments. But you have to hurry. This contest ends on the 10th of January at 11.59 Eastern Standard Time. So head over to Instagram and enter to win. Now, if you don't want to wait and you just want to get the ring, you don't want to wait for the contest. You can just go to AuraRing.com, use code WellnessForce, and you'll get $50 off your brand new ring. That's code WellnessForce over at AuraRing.com. You can start tracking. That's the key word, right? Tracking. Gathering the evidence that you are loved, that you're supported, and that you're on the right path, taking loving ownership of the most important thing to heal and be healthy this year and every single year after it, and that is sleep. So let's talk about this sleep and why it beats food for fat loss with Harpreet Rai. Welcome to Wellness Force. This is Josh Trent. Today, I have a very, very special guest on location, live and in person. My guest today is the CEO of Aura Health. After attending college in Michigan, where he studied electrical engineering, he walked a different path, led him into the investment banking space, where over the course of nine years, he frequently was sleeping only four hours a night while working in this kind of high-stress financial world. He rose to be the CEO of Aura in a personal path for better health and is here today to talk about why sleep beats food when it comes to fat loss, losing weight, letting go of old weight. Welcome to Wellness Forest, Harpreet Rai. Thank you. Appreciate that, Josh. Now, you told me that that might be your new bio. That might be my new bio. I'm pretty bad at it. Has anybody ever scripted a bio for a podcast for you like that? No. Okay. That was pretty awesome. I had so much fun just doing research on you. And this is, I've been really looking forward to this. I've been using Aura personally for, gosh, almost three years now. Awesome. And um, if people don't know what Aura is, just tell them really quickly. Like, what is Aura? What's your foundation? Aura, uh, you know, our our view is we want to improve human potential through better sleep. Uh, And so we make a device called the Aura Ring, and we have an app that gives you insights about your sleep. Hopefully, you can find things that help you improve your sleep over time so you can live a better life. Yeah, and that's really what this podcast is all about, to live life well, this physical and emotional. It's interesting. Before we started recording, we were talking about spiritual maintenance. You're like, I love talking about spirituality. And I think when we look at really what this ring is, it's a mirror of mindfulness. Yeah. It's a way that people can actually keep tabs on how they're showing up in life, how they're sleeping. But I realize that we're talking about a $40 billion industry. It's this, huge. This sleep industry. Yeah. Everything from beds that sense how you sleep to sound sensors and everything else. But over really, the pills? I mean, over the counter. Pills. You know, both prescription. Guess how many Americans take sleep pills, both prescription and non prescription? Blow me away with this number. Take a guess. Um, I'm going to say it's more than $5 billion? No, no. Mil- how many million Americans? Oh, how many million? I thought you were talking about money. I was like, hold yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually don't know the dollar amount. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's, there's 330 million Americans, yeah, right? Roughly All right. I'm going to say, yeah. I'm going to say five to 10 million Americans. 60. Okay. I was way off. Dude, so was I, right? I was way off. It's crazy. 60 million Americans. That means one out of every five people, roughly, mm-hmm. right? Somewhere between five and a half people. One out of every five and a half, if you find a half person. <laughs> but uh, are taking some type of sleep med. That, that to me, yeah. is just, like, mind-blowing. Why do you think, in the wake of pharmaceutical interests and all these other sensors and gadgets, that Aura is doing so well? Like, what is it about Aura that's really shining so light? Well, look, I, I do think it's a rising tide, you know, lifts all boats. So I, I, I think there's something with the market we should just talk about. Like why, why are 60 million Americans taking these pills at night? Right. Like, we yeah, let's talk, get to the yeah, truth. Yeah. I think there's, mm-hmm. that's partly it. So, you know, we're happy to be one of the companies that's trying to help people improve something probably a little bit, hopefully more sustainable. Um, you'd argue a, a worse business model, a pill you keep taking every day, uh, you know, or you keep using every day, but you only buy it once. But um, I, I, I think, I think really underlying the market is I was talking about this with someone else, another, company in the sleep space and actually a venture capitalist and we were like what is going on here and he basically was like it's anxiety it's depression it's people's poor diet and it's just amplifying itself yeah and his view was that social media everything you have with smartphones netflix is just amplified 
all these bad sleep habits. And people are more stressed during the day. People are more anxious. They're touching their phone 150 times a day, mm. right? That's like, you know, every seven minutes of your waking, if you're up for- I feel that day. too. I feel yeah. the pull to the phone a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and, you know, some of the studies done out there showed how that's basically like, a, like it's like gambling. It's like more addictive than gambling and sex and drugs. Right, is your phone. And so, <laughs> you know, so if you just think about that, if you're constantly getting pinged every five minutes, every 10 minutes, you're just more anxious, yeah. harder to sleep, right? If you're just being pulled in all these directions. So, and living life well leaves really big clues sometimes. And I think about the recipe for really actually allowing ourselves. That's the key word. It's allowing ourselves to live life well. Yeah. It's not always about the doing. Yeah. And I feel like when it comes to people that might want to have the perfect exercise plan, the perfect supplementation route, whatever it is, sure. if they're not tracking what they're doing, yeah. then doing more won't matter. It, it's the tracking that's really important. Totally. And yeah. no matter who you are as a business owner, like think of this metaphor. Everyone that has a business takes somewhat of an inventory. Yeah. Well, the aura ring, really, what kind of an inventory does this help people take? I mean, sleep is really a big focus. Yeah. That seems like the number one. Yeah. Is sleep the guiding light beyond just really the data sets and everything else? I, I think the view with sleep is like you start off your life with sleep, right? You like you literally wake out of a you know, unconscious state. So yeah. I think starting off there, like how are you gonna have, you know, how are you gonna function the rest of the day? What kind of day are you gonna have? What kind of mindset are you gonna have? Like we sort of all ask ourselves in the morning, like when we, we wake up, oh, how do I feel? Yeah. Right. And so I think being that guiding light is important in the beginning. Like, and if you can establish a frame of reference, like, hey, today's an awesome day. I'm going to, you know, go hit a PR today. I got, I actually did get, you know, first time in a while, some really good HRV last night and some good deep sleep. So I'm like, I want to get to the gym. Yes. Like I want to cancel a meeting or do something, you know, to, to get to the gym. But um, even, even vice versa, even more importantly, actually, if you didn't, hey, today was really, last night was really bad. It was stressful, right? Like you're actually now on a little bit more guide of a foot. Okay. Yeah. You know, I know when I don't sleep well, like I get more snappy. I do, right? Most all of yeah. us do. Like, we're all it's grumpy. different than hangry. Yeah. Right. Oh. Lack, lack of sleep is totally different than hangry. Yeah. Hangry, I feel like me hangry, I just don't want to talk to you. I just want to go eat and like, you know, be one with food. But I feel like lack of sleep or poor sleep, I'm just like I, I'm I'm just more snap I'm snappy, yeah. right? So uh, for me, it's really important. I feel like when I know I have a bad night of sleep, more important that okay, I'm gonna watch out. You know, all my hormones are off, right? My my ghrelin is up, my leptin is down, right? I'm going to be eating crappier food that's going to make me feel even worse, right? I might yeah. be actually, I might make a bad judgment today. And more importantly, what am I going to do about it so I can get ready for tomorrow? Yeah. Right, and, get and back on the right path. The weight loss industry, they talk about sleep, but their focus is primarily diet and exercise, yeah. which is a totally different paradigm. But we yeah. look at the numbers, right? CDC reports just recently, 71.6% of adults age 20 and over, or overweight or obese. Yeah. How much? 76? 71.6%. 71.6%. Which to me over, makes me want to take 25, a- Over 25, you said? It, over the age of 20. <sighs> which to me makes me want to take a deep breath and ask the question, how do we address this? Yeah. How is Aura addressing that specifically? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think weight loss and sleep, I, I saw it myself. So I, I did start investment banking. Um, I came in, you know, out of college. I came mainly because I had a bunch of student debt and I- you know, for the most part, grew up in New Jersey. So I had a ton of friends living in New York City. I'm like, oh, what do you do? What do you do? How do you get a job in New York City, right? Sure. That's, that's what you think about when you're 21 years old. You're like, how can I? It makes, it makes yeah. me think of the Pace Picani commercial. New York City, get a rope. Yeah. Like, what is that place? <laughs> so it's like, oh, how can I live there, right? That's what you're yeah. focused on when you're on the other side of the tunnel in New Jersey. You know, so I was like, oh, investment banking. Cool. I'll learn about that. You know, figure out how to get a job in that. And I gained a pound a week roughly a pound a week and i came in weighing 140 pounds i left weighing 180 this is when you're sleeping four hours a night four hours a night so i was like man you know i was actually back then this was 2008 2007 like had already started doing crossfit type workouts like was already eating pretty clean i was still eating carbs and you know but mainly not processed right mm -hmm. so just fruits right vegetables for some carbs and so i'm like how the hell am i gaining a pound a week like i, I wasn't eating more than 2,000 calories a day Right. And I'm like, and I'm like 21 and I have like a, you know, but then I started reading about sleep and lack of sleep. And I'm like, oh, wait, actually your fasting glucose levels rise. Your insulin response is like 50% lower. Yeah. Oh, wait, this hormone called ghrelin makes you hungry and you get way more hungry and then you don't feel as full leptin. Right. And so uh, for me, I think sleep and weight loss, like if you look at, 
mean, even if you look at some of our data, we, we even see it internally, like people's BMIs versus how they sleep are directly correlated. Yep. Right. Um, and so it's sort of the chicken and the egg sometimes. Was it poor sleep that caused people to be overweight? You know, I mean, forget it, right? Let's just like, you know, forget it's the chicken and egg. Let's make an omelet and make something good out of this, <laughs> right? Like yes. either way, it's a problem, yeah. right? So let's, let's you know, you address it from, hit it from both sides, right? Start eating right, start working out, right? And also start getting good sleep. But I think our society has sort of always focused us on the active state. It's always focused us on, hey, plan your workout, plan your diet, make that active choice. But we sort of look at sleep as a passive thing. We just mm -hmm. forget about it. There's even memes out there. I'll sleep when I'm dead. I'll sleep when like, I'm that's dead. That's not very intelligent. Yeah, right. Yeah. And and by the way, those people, I think a lot of them who've said that, some of the famous people have unfortunately passed away or had mm -hmm. you know issues like Alzheimer's earlier, right? Yep. So I, I just think people have thought about the industry, the marketing industry has sort of thought about, oh, make food sexy. You can sell a diet. You're going to make a choice to eat today. But we all make a choice too to sleep. We just don't think about it as much. And so uh, when you actually look at all sort of the you know biological, hormonal, biochemistry effects of poor sleep, yeah. I, I think it actually outweighs a lot of the things from poor diet. Do you actually believe that, and I'm curious with this massive data set that you have, do you believe that men and women truly need eight hours? Yeah. You know, there's Nick Littlehill talks about cyclical sleeping sure. and all these things. What do you believe and what do you believe from not just yourself, but the data yeah. that shows is eight hours really it? Is it quantity or is it quality? It's both. You know? Yeah, I think it's quantity and quality, right? Um, I think you need a little bit of both. Um, so I, I definitely think you need a little bit of both. Like if I had to guess what out, what out trumps what, sure, quality out trumps right, you know, out trumps quantity. Because you can sleep a long time if you get, you know, zero deep sleep, like you're going to be affected. And we see that in our data. Yeah. And we see that actually even there's even like, forget even our data. If you go look at there's, I should, we should actually definitely share this paper because it's one of the better ones we found or Hanu, our chief scientist found. And it was like a study from Stanford. They went through a bunch of sleep data and they even just showed actually one of the factors where people lack most is deep sleep. Um, like, you know, just you under the age of 60, there'll just be random subjects who just even in a lab, um, even over multiple nights, will just get zero deep sleep. Um, and then everything we're discovering now about the science of sleep suggests that deep sleep is like one of the most pivotal, you know, one of the most pivotal stages of sleep, even though it's a typical, typically the shortest. What blocks deep sleep the most? I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I wish I knew what yeah. blocks it the most. I think from what we see in the data, uh -huh. everything from timing. Right, your your body's a clock, so don't you want to start that clock at the same time? And mm. you know we're often starting at different times, so all our hormonal systems get shifted, and that definitely affects things up. So it's not like oh, I'm going to start the clock one day, and all of a sudden you know start it you know two hours later the next day. But most yeah. people do that every weekend. Well, there's there's yeah. habits for success in business. Yeah. There's habits yeah. for success in health. Health. Yeah. It's interesting. There's there's a quote here from Robert Stickgold. He's the director of the Center for Sleep and Cognition at Harvard Medical School. Yeah. And he says, now more than ever is an imbalance between lifestyle and sun cycle that's become an epidemic. Totally. It yeah. seems as if we're now living in a worldwide test of the negative consequences of sleep deprivation. Yeah. This point about starting our day at the exact same time for that circadian rhythm, which we talked about with Petri on episode 160. Yeah. How important is that? Huge. I mean, I think just getting the right sunlight exposure in the morning or just getting some sun. Yeah, we mainly are indoors. Right. Like just think about how we evolved. We were talking about camping earlier before mm -hmm. the show started. Right. How, how fun you, it is. How fun it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And from our data, when we even we saw just like small group had a couple of friends camping, we all got some of the best sleep scores we've ever had. Um, and we're like, all right, well, the earth is cooler. The, you know, sun goes down at, you know, call it. It was like six or seven o'clock. Right. So none of us are like in front of TVs. Right. It gets colder as we sleep, which we know helps. Right. But then also none of our cell phones really had reception. So it was like a combination of all those things that put us back into nature. And now, like, um, I forgot the gentleman's, you know, gentleman's name. Robert right? Stickgold. Robert Stickgold. I haven't met him. I just pulled yeah. the quote in context. So yeah. look, I, I think I think he's probably got, we are living this experiment of, okay, now we're living indoors, right? How do most people live, right? You get up, you're sort of scrambling to work, right? You yeah. have your cup of coffee, maybe a Red Bull, right? Diet Coke, whatever you want to have. Jump in the car, still indoors. Get inside, still indoors. And so like, where's your exposure to real light? Mm -hmm. right where's your exposure just to air and the environment right yeah um, and where's your real exposure to the ways that we were designed to actually live exactly isn't that what we're talking yeah. about right so i mean i think as far as sleep and like the quality versus quantity just getting back to your original question i think it's both you know i do think most people can get the right quality just by sticking to some basic principles so yes timing and just trying to be like getting that exposure yeah. you know during during the day at the right time i mean one thing about timing that's super interesting top three days in the u.s that people have more heart attacks 
right? Daylight savings, both spring forward and fall back. I forget the exact numbers, but Matt, Matthew Walker talked about it on Joe Rogan's podcast. But I think the study, when we looked it up, is something like 20% more heart attacks that day. And the other day is Monday, mm. right? And why Monday? People's like, you know, everything we know about cardiovascular disease and, and sleep, right? Like, yeah. People are getting less sleep typically or worse quality sleep on Mondays. Right, because you're like sleeping in on the weekends, and you try, you know, starting that clock again earlier after starting it later on Monday, and you know. And there's also that feeling of like, oh my God, I'm going to a job that I possibly don't like, well, yeah, which is causing right. stress response there as well. It's this purpose driven life versus, oh, I'm kind of a victim, and I, I don't yeah. know what's going on. I think once people start tracking, yeah, it actually helps them remove from this is happening to me, or hey, I'm monitoring it, so it's happening for me. Totally. My life is happening for, for me. me. Yeah. It's in- it's interesting. Somebody might start by just maybe committing to tracking their sleep for a week, yeah, and then notice how that commitment bleeds into other areas of their life. Oh, totally. Have you seen that from case studies? Yeah. In, in Aura. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like you. Once people start addressing their sleep, they start. You can start prioritizing everything else, right? So, hey, guess what? Oh, I'm starting to sleep properly. Probably get better deep sleep now. I'm in a better mood. I'm in a better mood, right? I treat people better. I'm not not as not a dick. I'm not as angry all the time, right? Or snappy all the time. Um, But even even think about like another goal. If you're trying to lose weight and you're trying to you know get to gym more often, like okay, now your performance in gym increases. Well, why is that? Okay, well, yeah, my testosterone, my growth hormones, probably being released you know more fully at night, so I'm actually recovering, right? A lot of my muscle repair is happening, so. You know, you you break muscle, you break muscle down in the gym. You don't get stronger in the gym. You actually get weaker. You get stronger after the gym, right? When you recover. And mm. so, um, I think just people forget that principle when it comes to sleep, right? Yeah. I, I did. I worked out as much as I could while working in finance, and like I herniated a disc, uh, tore my labrum, my rotator cuff, right, <laughs> and tro- tore my my MCL, right. Um, yeah. All from probably, if I had to guess, sleeping five to six hours a night for years, and still yeah. trying to get up at five a.m. and work out. People forget. You actually get stronger while you sleep. Sleep. These yeah. actin myosin fibers in the sarcomere, that's what creates lactic acid. And that's yeah. what actually gets to be healed at night when we're sleeping. But if you're not sleeping enough, yep. I mean, gosh, I'm going back four hours a night. Yeah. How were you surviving? What did you actually do? What were the changes you made to get out of that rut? Were you tracking anything? Um, this is way before Aura. This is way before Aura. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was. I was using wearables back then. Um, I was keeping a log. I mean, part of it was investment banking is a lot like a fraternity in the sense that like, hey, you're the, you're the first year. You're the freshman, like we're gonna load you up with as Ooh. much work as you can. So what kind of days are we talking about? Oh, I mean, routinely, probably once or twice a week, all nighters. <sighs> um, so like you you know, you don't go home or you go home and you shower and you come back, right? Like without sleeping. So there's definitely I mean, that was happening quite a bit. But yeah, roughly I'd leave the office at two to three. And, you know, by the time you get home, unwind, it takes a while to fall asleep because you're sort of wound up. Yep. Right. Yeah. I'd probably go to bed by three to four and sleep till eight and be up in the office by like nine 30. Do you feel like looking back, that was the reason why you got injured? Cause you weren't being mindful about your sleep. Um, definitely one of the leading reasons. Yeah. I mean, I would say actually like my form is something like I'd even then I'd start to tape like in a gym, you know, with a clunky yeah. palm, not even, not even the Blackberry cameras. Right. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I would tape it with that and like, look at stuff just on, you know, YouTube. So I'd feel like form wise, I was doing pretty well. I mean, look, I did get in a CrossFit for a bit. So, you know, sometimes doing, you know, cleans to failure isn't necessarily the safest thing either. But, yes, yes. Uh, so there's probably some learnings there. But um, no, I'd say most of the injuries were probably from a lack of sleep. You know, what's fascinating to me is, uh, what's also sad to me is if, if people are sleeping less than six hours, the research has shown, I'll put this in our show notes today, increase goes up 50% for injury yeah. if you have less than six, six hours, hours of sleep. Yeah. Have you seen this in the data sets where people maybe go for a long time and their sleep is low and then all of a sudden there's no record for a couple of weeks? Do you ever wonder like, did my user get injured from yeah. not sleeping enough? I haven't actually, that's a really good question. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, I haven't thought through that one. I haven't noticed that or like someone on our data team hasn't noticed it, but at the same time, we probably haven't looked at that. Yeah. Sometimes we probably attribute it to, oh, I'm getting crappy sleep scores. I don't want to look at this device anymore. Ah. But uh, uh yeah. Let's talk about that then, because yeah. you know monitoring is something that Gretchen Rubin talks about. She says self-monitoring strategy for behavior change. Uh, how does this ring loop into behavior change? You look yeah. at this continuum of behavior change. You know whether it's an external locus of control, which you're kind of a victim, or it's an internal locus of control. Sure. How does this ring plug into a behavior change program? I look. My my view is there's definitely a certain amount of users out there in the world, right? Or in the U.S. Is it 10 percent of the population, or 20, or 50? I don't know. But if you just show them a log data of what's happening, they'll start to question the data. They'd be like, wait, so why did I get really good sleep? Like even myself, last night, 
slept awesome. I got like two hours and 25 minutes of deep sleep. My HRV was close to 90 and it hasn't been there for a few weeks, right? I was in Finland, you know, jet lagged a bit coming back, but what did I do? I've been like thinking back in my head, oh, I did squat and deadlift, have heavy leg workout two days ago, probably needed a day to recover. And now that I'm recovered, okay, my body is, you know, responding hypertrophy, right? Some form of like super compensation coming back a little bit stronger. So to me in my head, that's what I think it is. Now, is that true or not? It's probably a host of things. That was probably the biggest stimulus I did that day. So probably my diet didn't change that tremendously over the last week. So Mm -hmm. for me, it was like, okay, I saw this data. All of a sudden, it's really good. I'm asking myself, how did that happen? And so now that I've associated something with that, positive or negative, right, then I'll try to do more of it to vet it out, right? Um, So I want to get to the gym today, right? That's like, that's my goal today, right? Outside of the meetings, outside of the work, even if it's going to be a little bit late workout, even if it's just something like yoga or the bike for 20 minutes, right? I'll try to get something in. Um, so I think as far as behavior change, when people start to see something that pertains to yourself, yeah, like data on yourself, it's personal. Mm-hmm. And then you just start to question the data. You'll see things that are aberrations from the norm. At first, you might do a holistic assessment. Oh, why am I not getting zero deep sleep is like the common thing we get from our users. Yeah. Oh, why am I only getting 20 minutes of deep sleep? So then you start to learn. You start to be like, okay, why is this? You start reading, oh, or listening from our users or you know podcasts out there that sleep time is important what time I eat relative to when I sleep, my blue light exposure at night, yeah. maybe that late workout. Um, we just had a user actually in San Diego. Uh, I think his Instagram handle is San Diego Joey. I'm giving him a shout out right shout now. Shout out to Joey. Yeah, awesome story. Probably one of the best stories we've heard in a while. Uh-huh. You know, he he actually has had sleep issues for a while. He works in construction. He got hurt at one point. So since then he's had like, you know, pretty, pretty big sleep issues. He actually found out and went and got an apnea test done. He has mild sleep apnea, like mild to moderate. Um, and then he's been using a CPAP machine for a few months. He's had an aura ring. By the way, he's a Spartan racer. You know, he he was at the World Championship, you know, in Tahoe this year where, mm, where we, right, we, yeah. we were hanging out. And, That's where uh, I met your dog for the first yeah, time. Yeah, you met Lola. And he finally found, he's like, I've been messing around with my sleep for the last six months. And here's what I finally found. I finally decided to cut out that four o'clock coffee. As soon as I started cutting out that four o'clock coffee, falling asleep quicker, start again for the first time ever, like, you know, 50 minutes to an hour of deep sleep. Mm, I love um, that you mentioned this so much Yeah, because caffeine, sometimes really strong amounts of caffeine, half-life can be 12 hours. Sure. Yeah. So somebody's having a coffee at three, yep. that's still in their system when they're in bed. Sure. Dan yeah. Party taught me all about this sleep yeah. cycle because he had background in pharma and then, you know, he does so much work with you guys too. Yeah. And I, I think about how what people don't know can hurt them so much. And just literally, let, let's really focus in on the caffeine. When people are having caffeine past noon, yep. that can affect their sleep cycle so much. And I think, you know, I asked you what could affect deep the most. I feel like that could be a very I, big I actually, piece. Yeah. You know, it was funny now when, uh, you know, we're down here and, you know, close to San Diego. And we were like, oh, you know, just going by the beach yesterday on Sunday. And I was like, I saw these Starbucks open at like four or five o'clock and people are packed. I'm like... How are they doing I'm this? I'm like, this should be illegal, right? They should How are you drinking this coffee at decaf five at night? Only. It's like decaf only after like yes. three o'clock, right? But uh, at the same time, when I was doing investment banking, I used to go get my, I used to be at the Starbucks in the building right before it closed at 11 o'clock because I knew it was like, I need to get through the next four or five hours. I need yeah. a cup of coffee, right? So, yeah. but getting back to behavior change, and by the way, Dan Party, same thing. He just shot me an Instagram message not too long ago. And he was like, I finally started being super consistent about the timing I went to bed. And he was like, oh my God, my results are off the charts. Uh, And so, you know, San Diego Joey, Dan Party, I I think once you just start to see the data becomes personal, you start to just reflect and start to change things and you start to notice patterns, right? And look, for for San Diego Joey, like he tried a bunch of different stuff over the last six months before he finally cut that four o'clock coffee out, Mm. right? It's probably the most painful, hurtful thing to change for him. Like he's already- Taking away someone's coffee. That's like, that's like- cursing in church yeah I mean, and that, that could be really serious yeah no <laughs> totally it's probably worse than cursing in church <laughs> like, some people but uh, i i think for you know when once he saw the data then he was like damn yeah now it's easy for me to stick to this i think before when you don't track and you don't see some of that data how do you how do you even know right like you you sort of feel like oh i think i slept better maybe i did maybe i didn't now i have something objective right that's telling me okay i slept better so that that that's a huge change now you're like w-. otherwise we we sort of i like to say Before, we probably used to be able to feel these things. If you rewind 30 years ago, 40 years ago, pre-internet, right, pre-game ping 150 times a day, right, during the waking hours, right, by our our cell phones, right, we probably did used to think and feel a lot more. But now we're so distracted, like, I I don't think we have time to feel. 
Like, you don't have time to feel. I have six emails to answer by the time this podcast is done. Probably more, right? So I don't have time to feel, like, how, how did it go? Like, maybe in my subconscious I'll think about it, but I don't think about it as, as deeply as I used to before when I'd probably be sitting at a bus stop waiting instead of, you know, even having an Uber on demand. Mm. But uh, so I think now that we're more distracted than ever, busier than ever, it's hard for us to feel. Um, and so I think tracking actually even makes more sense um, now mm. than it did before. And so, you know, these are just a couple of user stories. Um, and, you know, we've posted a bunch on our Instagram lately, a bunch of our users post and share some all the time. And so I think tracking just sort of holds you accountable. You start to look at the data and you just start to ask yourself simple questions. I do think we have to go, I don't know how big this user set is. You know, we think it's millions of people that can look at their own data and and sort of start to figure it out. I, I do think there needs to be more education. Mm-hmm. I do think there needs to be more community. I think there needs to be the easiest way to do it is just tell user stories, Yep. right? And like San Diego Joey, you know, doing that at four o'clock, now every one of our Aura users who has a cup of coffee, I, I want them to experiment. I, I hope they try. I can almost guarantee that someone that's either watching this or hearing this on iTunes, they're going to experiment from this show. Yeah. Just, you know what? I'm going to take out my coffee in the afternoon and I guarantee somebody's going to write in and say, you know what? That improved my sleep drastically, yeah. right? We look at the way that sleep is measured though. And there's, you know, the deep sleep, there's the light sleep. We talked about the hammock yeah. with Petri a couple of years ago. Why is it so important when you look at the data where that, that lowest resting heart rate is in the middle of the night? Yeah. We called it the sleep hammock. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I think um, one of the things we we talked about on the blog post associated with that um, as well is that how when it's towards the end of the night, that sort of means that your body is still working. So if you have a late meal or if you have alcohol or if you're super stressed, right, or even if you work out late, you'll see that it takes a while for your resting heart rate to go down. Um, so your body, if you think about it, it's just not relaxed, Yeah. right? It's still working. It's still preoccupied. It's either digesting the alcohol, that food, that stress, right, um, that meal, right, um, that late workout. So, um, you know, when you're, if you, if you want to think about mindfulness and meditation and having the best meditation session you can, think about sleep. Sleep's like this eight-hour meditation session where your brain shuts off, where you're not stimulated by email, right? You sort of want to be in optimal conditions, right? You take out your yoga mat, too, you take out your meditation mat, you want to be in a, in a dark, cool room. I mean, you should be doing the same thing when you're sleeping, right? So if you're having a bunch of coffee right before you meditate, right? Would you, like, we wouldn't do that, yeah. right? Or we wouldn't, like, pound a, you know, Peter Luger steak and then go try to meditate right after, right? So it's the same thing when you sleep. I think, like, you want to get your body set up for you know, success, right? Mm-hmm. And the condition set up for success. So looking at your resting heart rate is a good indicator of like, hey, was there something else going on where your body actually wasn't relaxed? Mm, and if that resting heart is is maybe, for example, at five in the morning and you get up at six, yeah. well then there wasn't as much restoration. Literally, exactly. the, the quality of sleep can be judged by the position of that hammock. Yeah. Uh, what are the other ways though that you measure the sleep quality? There's some other factors oh, I mean, in the app. Sure, there's a ton. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, movement, Maybe uh, we talk about the most important ones. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I mean, look, I think staging is important um, and sort of when the staging happens, we've also seen is pretty important. So, you know, in the in the first half of your night, you should sort of oscillate between light and deep sleep, right? And then in the second half of the night, you should sort of oscillate more between light and REM sleep. So um, everything we know about staging sort of indicates that and our brain's meant to go through those stages in a certain pattern. You know, um, we know the brain cleanses itself of toxins during sleep as well. So I... I guess it's, you know, staging correctly helps our brain, you know, sort of clear some of those toxins the way they're meant to be cleared. Yeah. But yeah, I think, you know, staging, getting enough stages of deep and, and REM are, are helpful into, you know, sort of leading into restorative and recovery. There's a latency uh, mirror. There's a percentage of latency sure. on the app as well. What is that yeah. for? Uh, latency is how long it takes you to fall to bed. Um, you shouldn't be falling asleep actually really quickly. If you, some people are like, oh, I had two minute latency. And we're always wow. like, uh, actually, that means you're too tired (laughs) right yeah that means they're just straight up exhausted yeah they're straight up exhausted right so tip i think you know good latency you know and this is third-party research out there Mm. is sort of anywhere between 10 and 20 minutes i think the optimal time has been indicated 15 minutes um so sometimes you know it'll take people an hour to fall asleep um they're restless there's other things occupying their mind they might have mild insomnia yeah right so i think they may be having too much coffee it's hard you know what i'm curious how you're integrating breath yeah. into aura because it, it's tattooed on my arm. We've talked about it yeah. on the show. Breath to me is so important. How do you integrate breath into aura and the technology aspect? Yeah, we do look at, uh, we do look at respiration rate and, you know, all throughout the night. So we give people an average of the respiration rate as well. That's another indicator to look at, you know, metric you can look at to see, Hey, was it breathing heavier or lower? We are introducing a meditation mode. So you'll be able to actually track HR, HRV, 
Oh, I'm getting excited yeah. now. And, tell, and tell us about the meditation piece. Yeah. Uh, when is that coming out? Uh, we've, we've been doing the work internally. It's uh-huh. looking really good. We're trying to gather more data. Uh, that's something we always try to do before releasing a feature. And so far, the data actually looks really good. I think some of the respiration stuff does look probably a little bit more challenging on people that have some type of condition. Um, so that's one thing we're trying to collect more data on. So if you're if you have a shallow respiration because you're of a certain age or if you have potential, you know, some type of hypertension, it may be harder for us to see that as accurately. But yeah, um, yeah we're going to introduce a meditation mode. So you'll be able to even just go from, you know, people looking at, hey, if I know my baseline resting heart rate typically and it's 55, when I do a session, you know, during the day, I'm a little bit more elevated. Can I get back down to some state of recovery? Mm. And same thing with HRV. Can I get into sort of a, you know, sympathetic, into a parasympathetic state? Yep. And this will be included with the app when they buy the ring. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So I'm very excited about this because right now I use Insight Timer, yeah. which I love. It's I love a, Insight It's a great Timer app. Too. Yeah. But I think about, you know, how do we make things as simple as, as possible? possible. Yeah. And not to um, do anything other than uplift the human, to allow the human to do things with as little investment, as yeah. much reward as possible. And I think about just using a ring. Why do you think the form factor of a ring is more effective That's than a, really a watch? That's a really good question. So I think, you know, there was two guiding principles there um, when sort of, you know, we have, so we have three co-founders, you know, uh, Petri, who you've met before. Was uh, I saying his name right on the last show? How do you actually pronounce his name? Uh, Petri. Petri. Okay. Yeah. I was close. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. And by yeah. the way, I'm probably not 100% okay. correct either. We're, we're doing our best. <laughs> we're doing our right. best. We're doing our best. Uh, the, Kari, he actually is sort of our mechanical engineer and designer uh, of the ring. And then um, Mark Kukoskala, he's like our optical engineer, genius, you know does all the stuff I could never figure out in college. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I think what they saw, frankly, in a ring was two things. From the science side, they saw that actually, you know, your pulse signal from your from your finger is about 50 to times to 100 times stronger than that on your wrist. Mm. And I think we sort of know this because hospital sensors, right? Like, you know, the, the ICU, Mossimo is always there on the exactly, finger. Exactly, Mossimo is always there yeah. on the finger. Why is that? That thing's plugged into a power source, right? It's plugged into the wall. Yeah. And they're still sensing from your finger. Why is that? Well, you know, those arteries on the inside of your wrist, right, that have much higher blood flow than the, you know, the veins on where your, your watch sits. Mm-hmm. Those, same, those same arteries go into your hand. You know, the skin is thinner here. Our skin's literally red. Even though I have darker skin than you, you know, here, our palms are roughly the same color, right? So the skin is uniform. The blood is very close to the surface. The blood, the pulse signal is very strong. So the result is the pulse is 50 to 100 times stronger than that of your wrist. So if you're going to measure a signal, you know, measure a signal there, right? Where it's stronger, right? So that was the first, I think, principle. Um, the second principle was if you just looked at what what people would wear to bed, would they wear a chest strap? We found most people didn't like that. Most people didn't even like the idea of a Who patch. wants to wear a chest strap to bed? I'm sorry, any companies that produce chest straps, but seriously, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who's doing that? Uh, the, uh, <laughs> I mean, before, for HRV testing, sometimes people were, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. I like, guess there's some cases. Yeah, right? before you had devices like yeah. Aura, right? So, yeah. um, and so we tried people with a chest strap. We tried, tried people with wearing something on their ears, like earbuds. But if you sleep on your side, it can be annoying. Yeah. Uh, and most people do sleep on their side. And we tried something on the head. That can be annoying as well. Um, right. Most people don't, it's probably not the most attractive either in bed, but, uh, and then, and then a wrist strap, right. Even just a watch, right. Yeah. 700 million watches are sold each year. I think over 3 billion people wear watches, right. But how many people wear those watches to bed? Most of them don't, right. They're uncomfortable. They hurt your wrist. Same thing if you're trying to cuddle, you know, sleeping is an intimate moment. So we stuck with sort of like what we like to call internally the oldest wearable out there, yeah. you know, so the wedding ring, right? Mm. Um, but the idea of a ring. So we found both from a comfort standpoint and an accuracy standpoint, it was just the place to be. Yeah. Um, it makes the most sense too for the modern world. Like, yeah. you know, people type a lot. Yeah. And I found that when I, I used to wear the Fitbit yeah. and it would scrape on the keyboard. keyboard yeah. And plus I would get woken up from the LED where yeah, it passes through the skin light. at night. I'd be like yeah. waking up in the middle of the night. So this is why I believe that not only is the aura going to continue to grow, but I'm even more excited now about this meditation yeah, piece because totally. we, we talk so much. It's in the M21 guide for, for our audience, this a discount aura, but also just this power of meditation, yep. you know, where we drop in and we actually figure out, okay, for 10 minutes today, what's going on? Yeah. Like what's actually happening in my life? And I think some people are analytical minded and they might be like, well, how do I know this thing's actually accurate? How do I know this aura ring is accurate? I might meditate, but how do I actually do it? And it's interesting to prep for the show. I was thinking about the Bulletproof Labs. They're 80% accurate in sleep. This, this, this how you design aura. Yeah. This yeah, is actually if, the, the tracking element. Sure. If you're so, going into a sleep lab, if you're going into a sleep lab, yes, yeah. the accuracy point, like is, is any sleep wearable actually a hundred percent accurate? Is no. that even possible? No, it's not possible. So yeah. Great for, thank you for bringing that up. I do feel like people don't know this. So if you go to a sleep lab and you get, it's called polysomnography data, right? Brainwave data. 
and you go and show that to one sleep doctor, let's say at Stanford, and you go show that to another sleep doctor at Berkeley, they will come back with 20, disagreeing on 20% of the data. And mainly because you're actually, you know, sleep staging is brain waves, right? Um, and so they classify them in different states, like deep REM, right, and awake. And so you will be between a certain frequency a lot of the night. And so they're like, hey, does this look more like REM? Does this look more like deep? I'm not entirely sure, right? And so, yeah, about if you if you show the same sleep data to two different sleep techs or sleep scientists, right, or sleep scorers, right, they will come back with disagreement on 20% of the values. Yeah. So no wearable can be that close, right? No wearable can be better than, call it 80% accurate, right? But then remember, there's also what we do at Aura and what all the other companies do is we, because no one, most people do not want to wear something on their brain when they go to bed, right? No. Like everything you'd wear in a sleep lab, yeah. right? Um, and so we look at physiological signals that correlate with sleep. So, um, and we try to draw out these models, all of us have slightly different models probably, but pro- if I had to guess, they're probably more similar than dissimilar. But, um, you know, what we look at then is, okay, how much is this core? What, what signals do we see in RAM? Okay, so in RAM, we know like you tend to be breathing a little bit heavier, right? You tend not to move as much. So, okay, how do we put that in an algorithm and then equate it back to the polysomnography results, right? So um, I think sleep test to sleep test, right? If you went and got it scored by a doctor, yeah. you'd be 80% sort of accurate if you want to call it that way. I think if you t- looked at any wearable, you know, us included, you'd be close to 70% accurate. And I actually, this is going to be sort of a little bit, maybe not as a parent to the user, but uh, the accuracy part matters, but I think the more, more, you know, the part that actually matters more for tracking is precision, right? So when you see a change night to night, did you see that change in your data? So if I'm San Diego Joey, I can say, hey, I got better deep sleep when I cut out that coffee. That's what's important to the user, yeah. right? So whether San Diego Joey really had five minutes of deep sleep when he was having a coffee every day, or he had 15, you know, who sort of, who cares? Either way, it was sort of low, Right. And then B, when he made the change, it was reflected in the data. Yeah. And then he figured out the right intervention, right? Or the right behavioral change. Right. Yeah. Um, that's how we have focused Aura's algorithms around. So we've focused a lot on sort of the device. We're not doing any data smoothing. We don't do any type of things to make you look like a typical 40 year old who's in really good shape, like San Diego Joey. Right. What instead we try to do is actually show you the deviation night to night based on our data. Mm. Um, and so I think. That's what's most useful to users. That's what's most useful in the context of tracking. That's where you're going to be able to see a change that you make in your lifestyle being reflected in the data. I think about accuracy and someone that might say, well, how do I trust? How do I trust if something's accurate? There's there's almost like a fear to start. And I feel sure. like, you know, uh, back in the day, another life when I was a trainer, if our scale was off three pounds, but yeah. we always use the same scale, scale. exactly. well, then we at least have a measurable baseline to yep. where we can move somebody forward to on a lifestyle change. Totally. And I feel like the same mindset when looking at, well, is the data really trustable? It's almost like a lack of trust within themselves. Yeah. Right. Well, I don't trust myself to start somewhere yep. because I can't possibly trust that device. Well, if you're using a device and you're tracking a, a process, you're going to see some type of change over time sure. as long as you use the same device. Same device. Has this yeah. come up in any of your forums? I know your community is very active. Um, you know, I, I, it hasn't, it's come up in some of our forums. I think in some of the, the Facebook forums it's come up, but really I think the idea of, so it's precision, I think is the term. Most people, pre- precision versus accuracy. So we've designed our algorithms to be extremely precise for the individual. There's other companies out there um, that will actually focus more on overall accuracy, but they'll lose night to night precision. Because what they'll say is actually, hey, Josh, you're in your mid 30s. You look pretty healthy, right? I don't know Thanks. if you're in your mid 30s. I have no idea. But I'm uh, 38. Okay, cool. Uh, so, you, you know, you're like me, you're in your mid 30s, right? You have a pretty good resting heart rate. It looks like you have a pretty good BMI, right? And then they'll actually try to curve fit you to that average cohort. Right. Mm. We have all this data. There's historic thousands of sleep studies done in labs. We know what the average 38 year old, right, who sort of weighs this much and has a resting heart rate of this, what their sleep is. And so there's other companies who will try to make their algorithms that on the face that appear more more accurate. But then what you end up losing is actually that night to night precision. So when you go and actually make that change, you know, you don't actually see it reflected in yeah. the data or reflected as much. Uh- I'm curious about the skin temperature. Yeah, I, I got sick a month ago, and yeah. I and I literally saw the increase in the graph. Yeah, and I and I could have. I didn't look too deeply into my data. I get these messages, and it says, "Take it easy today. Sure. You know, be mindful." I love these messages. They're not too strong. Yeah, they're not too little. It's like the Goldilocks message. <laughs> it just comes through when yeah. I need it, right? And I love that about the app. But th- when I look at the skin temperature, how does that factor into the algorithm? Yeah, I've been, I've been really curious about this. I, I think we look at it. A lot of this is data triangulation. So if your skin temperature was up, I, you know, if I had to guess, most likely your respiration rate was up and your HRV was down and your resting heart rate was also up. 
So all those things sort of those happen. are all the components of how your readiness score is factored. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So um, temperature is just one thing, uh, but yeah, we have three different temperature sensors in here. You know, we do look at that. So, and we've been actually trying to figure out should we place more emphasis on this when we do see a change in in temperature because you're likely coming down with you know being sick. Mm-hmm. So maybe we should actually have a stronger message. You know, not be so golden. Even a question like, yeah. are you getting sick? Are today? you getting sick? Yeah. Right. Or it looks are you like, feeling okay? Yeah. It looks like you're starting to get sick. Yeah. So. Um, but no, temperature, I think temperature during sleep, you know, the things that we know about temperature. So when your body releases melatonin, right, your core is actually trying to cool, mm. right? So you just like sort of the night earth, the you know, the earth cools at night, right? Sun goes down and the earth actually continuously gets cooler. So we do know one thing, you know, melatonin release. So we do see that in people's data that actually, hey, you know, likely their core is trying to cool it or trying to get ready for bed. During sleep, you know, actually some stages you change a little bit more. Um, I think some of the research out there will show that actually in, in, in REM sleep, your body doesn't thermoregulate as well. You know, I do think some of the other, there's other companies out there like ChiliPad or um, uh, I forget the other cooling device for your bed. But mm-hmm. um, they also have shown, I believe, in some of their research and other research out there that if you can keep people cooler, they tend to have prolonged deep sleep, yep. uh, you know, which I think is great. So, but yeah, it's just one of the many factors we look at. Um, I do think it is interesting to do it on the finger. If you think about it, when you get hot or cold, if you're cold, where do you get cold first? You get cold hands, in your yeah. hands and your toes. Hands and feet, yeah. Hands, toes, and, and even It's those. also where we yeah. have the most um, heat loss. Heat, heat loss, yeah. yeah, exactly. So we tend to see that temperature change in your core reflected even more greatly in your fingers than if we were on the wrist. Another reason why we like we like the fingers as well. I think about weight loss, letting go of fat, letting go of weight, yeah. all these factors for sleep hygiene. Uh, we had Doc Parsley on the show, yeah, which Kurt, I love. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, it's actually uh, Josh and I were filming this together here again. Uh, and we went to his house and he showed us his room, super black. Yeah. Nothing was in there, no right. technology. And he was really excited about just having a space that had nothing in it except for like darkness and sleep. Yep. That's actually what he talks about. And we've seen so many sleep experts talk about the light source yeah. in your room. In your room. Just, you know, we have these photoreceptors on our skin. We have photoreceptors on our eyes. Some of the things that can really, you know, optimize fat loss, not only waking up at the same time every day for yeah. the circadian rhythm, but also a bed temperature. And, and the research shows that 65 degrees for bed temperature is about the money spot. Yeah. Have you seen this um, from users that are reporting, hey, I made these changes and Aura reflected the yeah. changes? we definitely have seen that from users. I think we're actually trying to collect some more of that data um, you know, ChiliPad obviously I think has a great device out there. So that's someone that we're trying to work with to collect more of that data. But yeah, we've definitely seen when you reduce your temperature, you tend to improve the quality of your sleep. Yeah. We've seen it when people go camping. So you go, you know, camping outside, it gets cooler than normal. The earth gets cooler throughout the night. Oh. Yeah. So uh, we are actually doing some data collection on that with some people who are living outside still. So that's going to be fun to do. So yeah, I think um, I think temperature is a pretty important factor. If you think about just like if you're, Sensing, what are your five senses, right? Noise, sight, sound, right? Feel, taste, yeah. taste right? Yeah. So how do you how do those senses sort of change when you're sleeping, right? It's, okay, temperature, how do you feel, right? Light, what do you see? Maybe, you know, if you're sleeping on something really uncomfortable, what do you touch? Uh, what else do you feel? So I think, um, how do you, you know, there's, there's, there's been all types of yeah. research being done, sort of, if you can change some of these sensory inputs, can you change the quality of sleep? A unique piece to talk about too is, and, and Parsley talked about this, it's sleep is creating a barrier between everything you have within your body yeah. and the outside world. It's a true barrier. Yeah. So one barrier that is not really talked about a lot and I'm curious if it ever shows up in your data records, is EMF. Yeah. You know, we have rooms, like we're in a a place right now, I'm sure there's EMF spraying everywhere here in Southern California. Sure. And with even 5G coming out, people are freaking out about 5G. How do you think EMF truly affects sleep? Yeah, I think, so we've definitely seen it with people who are already immunocompromised, that they tend to be more sensitive to EMF, right? So if your body's already somewhat broken down, right, maybe you have some type of chronic disease, right, then Mm -hmm. you tend to be even more sensitive to the EMF. So I think that we've seen, we've even heard some stories of users of ours when they finally put their, unplug their laptop and shut it off, that they see that their sleep quality improves. I mean, that to me is like crazy. Wow. Yeah. So I think um, EMF is big, light is big. You know, professional sports players, um, a lot of them now when they travel in hotels, they'll bring like duct tape and you know, plastic, yeah. dark plastic trash bags because yeah. they just want to literally get every single light source out. So I, I think Dr. You know, Parsley is right um, for focusing on being, you know, quiet, right, temperature and being dark. So uh, EMF, though, I, I, if 
the more and more I want to collect more and more data, we want to collect more as a company. Um, I definitely think it's going to have a huge impact, especially as we start to see more and more of it with things like 5G. Um, you know, I think Ben Greenfield, he's pretty, you know, enamored. Dr. Mercola is pretty enamored about like making yeah. sure that they, you well, know, have less EMF. <laughs> Dr. So. Mercola sleeps in a Faraday case. Yes. Like he has like yeah, nothing zero. coming in and yes. Ben has a kill switch for his house. I'm yeah. Like, I don't know if all of us can do that at this stage, but yeah. you're right. There, there is degrees of change. Yeah, right? and and like, look, I, 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 for again, I was like camping with probably five other Aura Ring users. Right, we were actually at a camp conference in in north of north of you know San Francisco, and it was everyone was sort of sleeping outside, and it was really cool to see that. And then we were like, oh, I wonder what it is, and I was like, it's got to be a combination of everything. It's very low EMF out there. And then also we're not using our cell phones because mm. we had very low cell signal or zero cell signal, yep. right? And the temperature got cooler at night, right? And also then, you know, light exposure, right? No no bright lights, no TVs, no electronics, right, before bed. So it's probably a combination of all those things that help improve our sleep. Yeah. So, you know, I'd bet, you know, Ben and Mercola, it's probably all, it's not just that there's less EMF, it's probably also that they're not on our cell phones probably like, you know, right before they go to bed, Yeah. right? So it's, it's probably a combination of all these things that help improve. And so you just got to see what you can in, do in your environment. I think everyone trying to get kill switches in their house is probably hard. Um, you know, trying to move to different locations for some that, you know, like living outside of a city is probably pretty hard. So what are the small steps you can take to start seeing a change, right? Yep. And so maybe the first ones are just getting rid of like some electronic devices or the bright lights in your, or the TV, sleeping with the TV on. That's one I actually want to collect more data on. Like I'm convinced just from seeing other people's data, when they fall asleep with the TV on, you just get so much disrupted sleep mm. um, and actually, you know, ruins the quality of your sleep. Um, I've seen that even there was a professor, Dr. Ethan Weiss at UCSF, and he shot us a story um, on Twitter. And he was like, I fell asleep in front of the TV. My wife was gone. You know, she's gone for a week with the kids. So he's like, I'm sort of a bachelor again, you know. And, you know, by that he meant like staying up late and watching Netflix. Yes, yes. And so on his couch and <laughs> falling asleep. And so he was like, I, you know, he didn't even fall asleep late. He just fell asleep at the same time. But he had the TV on watching Netflix. And he did that two nights in a row, uh, fell asleep, middle night, woke up, went to the bedroom, totally disrupted sleep, zero deep sleep. The next night he was like, I still watch Netflix. And not using blue light blocking glasses or anything yet, you know, we'll get him some, but shut it off and went to his bed, much yeah. better quality sleep. Wow. So I think a lot of it is just getting back to your point, like, can we all live as extreme as some of these people? Maybe one day, right? Um, but maybe small steps first. Yeah. Like, shut off the TV. Yeah. Go to bed. Maybe then, oh, you're going to watch TV, you're going to watch Netflix before you go to bed, put on the blue light blocking glasses first, right? So I think it's these incremental steps and you start to see the changes in your data and that sort of encourages you encourages you to take that next step. Yeah, if you're like me, if you're, you know, an obliger personality type where yeah. you do well with external frameworks for accountability, which yeah. is, I think uh, the data shows from Gretchen's podcast, I think it was like 60% of people are like that. Yeah. We do really well when we're changing our life by having external frameworks of accountability, these mirrors of mindfulness that shine on us. I'm curious though, like, is there something that you've come across in your research, in your work, that is kind of a secret to using sleep for fat loss in a hygienic perspective? Is there any one thing that people can do that people might not know about that would really increase their quality of sleep? Hmm. Any one thing? Um, maybe the one that I think people don't know much about is stretching and relaxing before bed. So I think that's blue light you probably hear more about, the sleep timing you hear more about, you know, even what time you eat your meal you know, relative to when you go to bed, you hear about, but I do think stretching, cause most of us are just desk bound all day. Yeah. Right? Like, you know, Kelly Starrett's book. Right. So like, you know, I think we're just constantly in a state of tension and stress. Our bodies aren't meant to sit there and, and at a desk for that long. So I do feel like stretching actually helps a lot and think about it like almost like yoga before, like an intense yoga class, you'll see all the, you know, yogis or yogis in training. What do they do before the yoga class? They're already loosening up right? They're already getting warm, right? They're already starting to do some cat, cow, downward dog, yeah. right? Even some just child, you know, child's pose, right? Just to start to loosen up. So think about the same thing for sleep. You're about to go into uh, eight hour meditation, hopefully, right? Um, so how can you loosen up and prep before? So I think stretching is one. Gwyneth Paltrow, um, she swears by it. She's like foam rolls every night before bed. So I, I definitely think it helps lower your respiratory rate, probably helps relax your heart rate, so it gets you sort of in this active mindset of relaxing. That is a little secret key that I haven't heard about, yeah. stretching before bed. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious if Gwyneth has ever posted on Instagram with her aura ring. No, that she not just that stretched. I know. <laughs> you got to get her an aura ring. You got to get her one, yeah. <laughs> Help her quantify how good her phone rolling. So, so many people are starting, you know, they're hearing this podcast on the first day of 2019. Yeah. You know, it's like they're starting the new year. They're like, how do I actually do this? 
What do you actually think about people that do these New Year's resolutions? What in your experience, and maybe with Aura for these three, four yeah. years now, if people are tracking just one thing, like their sleep, yeah. is that going to make them, over the course of time, stick to that intention, stick to that promise to themselves in a lot more higher potential? Huh. I mean, I, I do think there's something to be said about something that's a reminder and something that's physical. So... Like, why do we wear wedding rings, right? Um, you wear wedding rings because you're wedded to someone else, right? Mm. You want to remember that person all the time. Especially if you think about, like, you're about to do something bad, like grab another girl's hand or do something, you'd probably see your wedding ring. So, like that what would Jesus do moment, right? So, um, I do think there's some accountability with wearing a physical device that's symbolic of something. Yes. Right? So, I think, you know, Fuel Band had it. I think Fitbit had it. I think we're a little bit more subtle. That can hopefully design into your life a little bit better and more comfortable to wear to sleep. So, I think there's something about that. I do think that, frankly, what you were talking about before, like having some type of external measure yeah. is helpful in achieving a goal, right? If you don't measure something, how does it get mastered, right? And mm-hmm. like we have all these dashboards for, you know, our website. We have Google Analytics for our websites, right? We have different types of um, analytics for our social media feed, right? Like why not have some type of analytics for your body and your health, right? Um, so I, I do think, is it the be-all, end-all? Is sleep the be-all, end-all? No. Right. I, I think there's so many things we need to do to be great humans, right? So we need to be more mindful. We need to eat better. We need to exercise more. We need to sleep better, right? Um, we probably just need to treat each other a lot better too, mm. right? Uh, and so I think, you know, it's a it sleep's a great place to start. I'd almost argue if you don't sleep properly, it's going to be hard to do all those other things. Yep. Um, I would argue that it's a really good foundation. Um, but I think it's it sets you up on the right track to succeed. So I'm someone who responds to external you know, Cal, I've always wanted to, you know, maybe get better than a B in class. I didn't need to have the highest A, but, you know, I'd like to have good grades. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think most of us are probably like that. And so when we have an external measure, I think it helps. And so I think, you know, Aura is, you know, one of the one of the many. Um, and we're glad to be part of one of the many. And we want to work with others, right? So yep. I think it's important that yeah, like you start somewhere as a, you know, when you're looking to what should I do 2019, I'm trying to lose 20 pounds, right? How should I start? I think sleep will set your body up for success to help you do all those things a little bit easier, frankly. Yeah. And, and for the people that might be thinking, well, is the sleep really going to help? Research shows that we have this mechanism in our body. It's leptin and ghrelin response. If research shows that you can actually consume 250 to 500 more calories in a day if you're chronically sleep deprived. Yeah. I mean, the math is there, yep. whether, whether you're spiritual or analytical. Yes. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> if you don't sleep, you are going to eat more food. It's a yeah. physiological response. Totally. Let's talk about this a little bit because yeah. I know that, that this is a big piece for people that want to let go of weight. Yep. You know, this leptin ghrelin response. Uh, talk about that somewhat, how that relates to aura. Uh, I mean, I think that one's huge to me, right? Especially like I notice it when I travel. Like, why do I crave crappier food when I travel? Yeah. When I travel, I get less sleep right? I'm getting poor quality sleep. I'm getting less of it. I'm disrupted, right? I'm switching time zones. But then like, yeah, you think about, okay, what's happening to my body? So yeah, when I get six hours versus eight hours or four hours versus eight hours, right? Your ghrelin levels, your hunger hormone shoots up by 50%. So I'm going to be more hungry. And then when I eat, I'm going to feel less full, you know, my leptin, right? So uh, that's your satiety, right? Hormone. So your body is probably signaling to itself, hey, we're in, we're in this sort of fear mode, we don't know why you've gotten four hours of sleep. We don't know what animal was like chasing after you, right? That Facebook animal or that Netflix mm-hmm. animal at night, right? <laughs> but that animal that's chasing you, now we need to get ready and preserve ourselves. So what are we going to do? When we see food, we're going to want it more, right? And when we eat it, we're going to keep it on, right? We're not going to actually use it as quickly. So I think that's part of what happens. I think the insulin response is another really interesting thing, right? So um, I think, you know, everything from the science has shown that if you get six hours versus eight hours, your insulin response and your, you know, fasting glucose levels, your fasting glucose levels can rise by 20%, 20 to 30%, depending on the amount. And then also your insulin response will be 30% less effective. So, okay, now just think about what your body's just done. I'm hungrier. I crave more sugary food. Okay. I eat that sugary food. By the way, the glucose isn't cleared as quickly. Yeah. Right. And then, and then what's happening also, I mean, it's like a perfect orchestra, right? Then my leptin isn't going down. So I actually feel hungrier. Mm. Right. So it's like, okay, now your body is literally set itself up to eat more and hold on to that weight. Right. So I, I think sleep and weight loss is probably one of the most over, you know, overlooked things out there. I, I just had this awareness as you were speaking about earlier mindfulness, and now we're talking about analytical with the data. Yeah. The body will hold on to as much energy as it can yeah. if it doesn't feel safe to let it go. Totally. 
So analytically, it's like, yeah, you are going to eat numerology more calories if you're not treating your body how it was designed. Yeah. Have you ever specifically, since you found founded Aura here, I'm not to, one of the founders, but yeah. Oh, so since yeah. you run Aura, yeah. Have you dealt with this personally? Where yeah. you're tracking your data and you're like, okay, I need to shift things massively totally. right now. All the time. All the time. Yeah. Still, Even still. Yeah. That's honest. Definitely. I yeah. mean, I travel a lot. Or, you know, Most of our team is based in Finland, so I travel a lot, right, um, from California to Finland. So that, that definitely is tough. Without a doubt. I mean, any startup, I think one of the reasons so many entrepreneurs, right, like use and like our device is because they, they find themselves always trying to balance how hard they should push in the workplace, maybe not in the gym. Right, but they know they need to be productive. They know to, they need to be getting a thousand emails answered every day. Right, so how do you how do you do all of that? Right, and so I think um, there's totally a combination too between sort of you know even if, even being self aware and looking at data, but still practicing it. Right, so yeah. again, and I think a lot of Type A personalities we tend to push ourselves pretty hard in sort of every direction that we go, whether it's a gym, yeah. whether it's a diet, whether it's productivity, whether it's work. Right, and so setting up some external accountability factors helps keep us in check. Right. What's made the biggest difference for you in the knowing versus the doing? Hmm. You know, you have the knowing with your data sets. Yeah. And you have all the knowledge, right? But in the middle is this bridge. Yeah. And it's kind of who you are, right? This yeah. self-awareness. That's a really good question. I think um, I have a coach. So by the way, like I didn't used to have one. And and I would say having a coach, I actually have two. Uh, so <laughs> um, And both tend to be biohackers, which is also nice. But uh, um, they've also been way more accomplished than I have, both of them, um, in sort of starting companies, running companies. But one of them put it to me in a really good way that, hey, when you get less sleep, you're you're doing a disservice to yourself the next day, right? Like you're 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 being the worst person that you, you're not being the best person you could be to show up. And so in this case, it was like, hey, I I was talking to him. We just had a coaching session, and I was like, man, I just came back from a flight from Finland. You know, I've only been back for one night. I'm still completely exhausted. But there's this basketball player on the Golden State Warriors. That someone was like, hey, we're going to meet this guy. Why don't you come hang out? Like, he's super into analytics and tracking. And I was like, man, that sounds like a lot of fun. But they're going out to get drinks at 9 o'clock at night. I'm mm. normally in bed at 9 o'clock because I'm up by 5, right? So, And I just was – he was absolutely right. I would have gone out. I would have also – I'm already going to be tired. I'm not going to be the best you know, version of myself in front of him. Then I'm going to ruin my whole next day and not be the best version of myself for my whole team, right? And mm. so it was that visualization, that cue, I think, was really important to me. Um, just like um, like thinking of you're making an active choice, not a passive choice. You're making an active choice not to be the best version you can be of yourself. So to me, that got me. The other one that actually really got me too from sort of the knowing and the doing was guilt. And I, I think like maybe because of the culture that like I grew up in when I was doing investment banking or worked in right out of college and finance. And it was like, you always had this guilt if you weren't in the office. Like, you, you know, everyone around you just like, you know, kept pushing like work, 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 right? And so like when I wanted to finally lose some of the 45 pounds that I put on in the first year of investment banking, right? It was like, I felt guilty about leaving work. I felt mm. guilty about going to work out, like, you know, to get a workout in. And so then I started to realize like, well, none of these guys are going to look out for my health, right? Like it's not their job to, right? Their job is to get the most value out of me that they can, right? And, and for me to produce work so that, you know, we do well as a company. But at the same time, like long-term, I need to look out for me. Um, and I just realized, like, I had this guilt of going to work out to get out of the office 30 minutes early or, you know, take a 30-minute long, long lunch break. Yeah. So I think this, I, realizing that, like, what are most people's barriers? Typically, it's, like, time, right, money, and guilt. Um, and a lot of times, like, we won't make time. And and there's people with Aura. You, they, like, we definitely see this with Aura users. Like, you have kids or you're running a company, right? Yeah. Or, like, you're you, a busy mom. You're a busy mom, mm-hmm. right? Like, you you feel like you should really go do this, take your kid to that practice, be the one who's, like, helping them do their homework at night. And you probably feel guilty, even if you have the means to, having a nanny, getting someone else to pick up the kids from daycare, right? You probably feel guilty about that if I yeah. guess I'm not a parent. But I know for sure my mom did. She felt totally guilty anytime she, mm-hmm. like, not just because of the monetary cost, but she's like, I'm not being there for my kid. And And I think, look, it's a balance. Everyone has to figure out how to, like manage their own lives. But I do think there's this overwhelming fear of guilt that we place on ourselves um, sometimes for the expectations of others. And at the end of the day, like, look, you're only going to be so happy and your kid's only going to be happy if you're yeah. happy, even if they don't recognize it yet. Like I certainly didn't recognize it as a mm-hmm. kid that like, hey, I was only going to be happy if my mom was happy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do now a little bit yeah. more. Um, and I imagine when I have kids, I'll, I'll have even more. But it's, I do think we place, a lot of people put this barrier and sort of this thing up of guilt. How did you transcend the guilt? 
in regards to your health huh. and just giving yourself the permission. I mean, I, I think that was a really hard thing for me to do. A lot of it in the beginning was like getting to a place in my career where I was confident enough that like, hey, there's a little bit of like knowledge and not mastery, but like I know what I'm doing. So like even if someone's going to tag me out for, you know, being 30 minutes, like not in the office for 30 minutes, like sort of like hey, come on, like I've been here for some time, been working this place for a few years, like, you know, I'm committed to it. So I think a lot of it was unfortunately like I needed to have a foundation. Yeah, I think think now I've just started to realize coming back to that first one, like, well, if I don't do this, long-term, I'm going to be unhappy. Long-term, even medium-term, I'm going to feel like crap. And so sort of realizing that like, hey, yes, I feel guilty now, but I'll, I'll feel even guiltier in the whole, in the midterm yeah. uh, if I don't do this. Right. Um, oh. And and ultimately I think like it's, it's a hard thing to do. Like as an entrepreneur, you're, you're like, you know, you're really trying to push yourself to the limit. And sometimes you forget that like, Hey, you're just as human as everyone else. Oh, so many people right? listening can relate to this. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being so honest too. Cause yeah. I think what you're talking about, this badge of honor that so many people, especially entrepreneurs, it, yeah. it's rampant in the entrepreneur space without a doubt badge of honor of, of how busy I am. Yeah. But is that really giving us fulfillment? that's the other thing you got to ask yourself as an entrepreneur, like, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Right. And if you're not happy, even if you're helping make a lot of other people happy, right. You're, that's not going to last that long. Right. My dad, like always made fun of, unfortunately, like someone in our family who's an artist and he's like, well, if you don't pay the bills, you're not going to be happy. Right. Because like, you know, like if you're going to be an artist and like try to figure it out and not be able to pay your rent, like you're going to, you're, you are going to be unhappy. And, and like, I think there's a balance there, right? Like, yes, you need to love your work, but there's some realities about work, you know, about, like why you work too, like you need to be able to survive. Right. And so, you know, luckily, you know, my cousin, she was able to become an awesome artist and be able to like survive and thrive. I'm glad she didn't listen to him. (laughs) I'm glad she didn't listen to him. him. Yeah. But, um, you know, he was just more pointing it out from, from his point of view. Well, Um, parents, they're always trying to do the best. And like everyone, I believe this, everyone is doing the best they can truly. So when we hear that, you know, don't do that, you might not make enough money or whatever. It creates kind of this scarcity mentality in whoever's listening, whoever's accepting it. Yeah. And, And I think the really you know, Aura is a, an amazing company, but it's also kind of a Trojan horse in a way because it's allowing people to wake up yeah. to what's really going on with their life. Totally. Do you ever see personal development being a part of Aura or conversations about personal development through the use of mindfulness wellness technology? Yeah, um, we're starting to see a lot of interest actually from that, from you know uh, the corporate wellness side. Yeah, specifically, I mean, they'll like to pilot things and start things with sort of the management level of some of these like larger corporations or mid-level corporations. So I think we're starting to see at least interest there. Like I think I'm just, we haven't talked to Google about this, but the Googles of the world are starting to probably realize that like, Hey, if you get less sleep and you show up to work less productive yes. long-term or even medium term <laughs> over the course of like a month, that's probably not good for Google. They want right? the most out of their yeah, employees. They want the most out of their employees. Yeah. Right. And they want their employees. What's the biggest cost of it? You know, and, and, and it's hiring. It's hiring and retaining, right? And so if you have people who are unhappy, you know they're going to leave. If they're happy, they're going to stay, yeah. right? So I think we're starting to see finally this corporate mindset of like move away from just, hey, working 100 hours a week into like how do we make our people really happy and how do we make them really stay and how do we make them the most productive? So uh, we are starting to see some interest there. And I, I think it's it's happening for the whole industry, not just us. Yeah. And it's exciting too to, to be able to talk to you about this on the show because people are thinking, wait a minute, this is the leader of a product? Like, what are you trying to sell? Well, actually, everything that we do is a decision based on energy of money and the way that money flows is in and out, right? Yeah. So we look at the things we spend our money on right now. Totally. What could you take out of your life that would allow you to have more energy financially, yeah. right? Whether it's a cable subscription or buying crappy food or you know doing something that you know isn't serving you that you could let go of and then bring in the energy to do something like purchase an aura yeah. or, and then that would lead you to other, like this, you know, kind of cumulative effects of better decisions. Totally. How do you see this unfolding for the wellness industry specifically? Do you oh, think huge. that do you think that Aura will be something that grows to the size of a Fitbit? Do you guys have that dream, that to. vision? Yeah, without a doubt. I think, you know, Fitbit is I don't know what they're going to ship this year, probably 15 million units. Like I haven't I saw the latest quarterly release, but um you know, I think it, like if you look at the wearable market, it's 110 million markets this year is to 110 million units and growing about 10%. So You know, Fitbit and Apple are at the top. And then Xiaomi actually out of China is right there, all sort of north of 15 million units. Um, You know, I think Aura for sure. There's, um, you know, we have hopes to be one of those four players, right? 
or the fourth player, right? However you want to look at it between those, you know, between those guys. And I definitely think getting market share of 10 to 15% over time is is doable. Um, I think our focus on sleep is different. I think those other products all sort of focus on activity and steps first. Maybe the Apple Watch focuses more on notifications first, right? Like how to tie into the Apple ecosystem. But um, I think when we start to see more and more science put out about sleep, and frankly, we do it every day. So one of the big things with working out Look, even I like to I like to work out, right? But uh, I don't have the time to work out every day, or I haven't prioritized enough, or let go of some of the other guilt, right? To do it enough every day, right? Um, and hopefully, I will get back to doing that because I, I have been there before, uh, and it feels great. But um, fifteen percent of the U.S. works out every day, or works out every week. Ninety nine point nine percent of the U.S. sleeps every night. So I think, like, as far as one thing that you're going to focus on, you know, people are going to do right that can actually help make a huge improvement in their life. I think sleep's actually a better place to start. I think we got to get past some of the marketing you know, of just push yourself, push yourself, you know, work out harder, get 20,000 steps, not 10,000 steps. So I think there needs to be a little bit more education done there. Right. Um, I don't think people know, I don't think the average, you know, person knows the association with, you know, sort of sleep and weight gain, right. Sleep and productivity, sleep and, 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 you know, frankly, even just, there was a really great study we just saw Dr. Rebecca Robbins out of NYU shared it with our team. They were showing fMRI tests of someone who slept six hours versus eight hours of like when asked to actually solve a problem the next day. When you looked at the image, it was like less than half of the cells were firing from someone who slept eight hours one day was trying to solve a problem versus someone who slept six hours a day. Wow. Like if you just show that to any entrepreneur, you're like, here's your brain on drugs. Yes. Wait, no, this isn't <laughs> drugs. This is six hours of sleep. And here's your brain on eight hours of sleep. Wow. And if we, you can we need think, a commercial like yeah. the egg in the pan. Remember yeah, that? This exactly. Brain on drugs. We need a commercial like that for yes. sleep. So I think there needs to be a little bit more awareness on sleep. And look, it's starting to get out there. We were talking to someone who works at the New York Times the other day. And they're like, no, no, people know about it. I was like, oh, really? People know about it. How many best time selling books are there? New York best bestsellers are there on sleep? Zero, right? How many bestsellers are there on food, diet, and exercise? Oh, God, yeah. Right, hundreds, yeah. right? So, like, I still think the world is waking up to this. And luckily, you know, I think we're happy to be one of those companies that's helping that along with others. So I, I definitely think this industry, this wellness industry, what you spend your money on is growing. I mean, look at the, the dollars spent by corporations and insurance. Yeah. $13,000 now to insure the average American. $13,000, right? So that's 20, I think it's like close to 20% of our GDP as a country, right? And it's growing the fastest, right? So clearly, and, and despite all that, 70, what did you say? 71.6%? 71.6%. Obese of us, or overweight? Over, obese I'm, or overweight. I'm curious how much right. of that is obese. Yeah. So, yeah. oh, it's it's half. Uh, that's that. It's got to be close. Yeah. yeah. It's it's like basically like a third of the country is obese, a third is overweight. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty insane. So I think spend wise, where we're going to, you know, I think corporations are starting to put their money, realizing that, hey, we need to invest more here so we get more productivity. So we get happier workers. Yeah. So we reduce our costs in other places. And we're seeing this with John Hancock and, and the reimbursement with yeah. insurance companies and, and Fitbits. I think it was Aetna or United Health, one, I, of, the, one think, of those partnerships. I think United Health, if I if I had to, if I, I don't know the insurance side like off the top of my head, but I think Aetna is actually the biggest one. Uh, sorry, United Health is the biggest. And then I think Aetna is you know, falling pretty closely behind. I'm, I'm really grateful to be alive yeah. in this time that this technology exists. I'm grateful that you forgot about the traditional path <laughs> and went your own way in this unique journey. What do people not know about you that you haven't shared on a podcast? What's Man. something about your own health that you're currently working Whew. on that most people don't know? What most people don't know about me. I have long hair. Most people don't know that about me. I saw it, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I saw, when we came in, he wasn't wearing the I turban. I wasn't wearing my turban. I just <laughs> come out of the shower. Um, so health wise about me, um, let's see. So I've, yeah, I've after college gained 45 pounds just by mm-hmm. not sleeping. Yep. Uh, so I think some people know that about me, not everyone. Uh, I probably a history of autoimmune diseases in the family. So my you know, thyroid problems across, I would say other, yeah, other health issues like that run in the family. Um, as far as me, I have alopecia errata. So actually on my beard, you can sort of see it on the underside. Like half my beard is like massively thinning versus the other side, autoimmune disease. Mm. I'm trying to think what else do people know about me or not know about me? I don't know. Health-wise. Well, thank you for sharing those yeah. because, you know, we're all dealing with something. Every human sure. being, yeah. nobody comes into this world a perfect placement. Like, you know, yeah. this isn't Gattaca. We don't get to gene <laughs> at it yet. Although maybe we will with like, you know, CRISPR coming out. Totally. That possibly might happen down the road. Yeah. But I, I think what I've loved most about talking with you today is not only like the science, the academia, the case yeah. studies, yeah. how many people whose lives are being transformed just by tracking something, specifically yeah. their sleep. Uh, how do you see wellness? You know, what is wellness to you now? Coming 
like coming from your background, yeah. charging, not aligning yeah. and hustling. Yeah. Uh, what's your definition of wellness now? Uh-huh. It's a hard thing. I think if I had to, we were talking about this today with a team. If I think about wellness, I sort of think about it like a four-legged table or chair. And if I had to break it down analytically, like I, I'm a little analytical. So I think um, you have sleep on one of those legs. I think you have sort of consciousness or meditation on another. Mm. I think you have diet in one and you have exercise in another. I think when we think about those four elements, we think about wellness. I, I think it's sad, frankly, that like every company tries to just focus on one and say that theirs is the only answer. So, you know, there's certain companies who are very keto focused that keto is the answer. The diet is the answer to your whole life. Just like, stop it. Just like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> our, yeah, yeah, sorry. So, uh, <laughs> now we have our little dog here is wandering around. Um, I think there's other companies who focus on meditation. You know, Headspace just focused on meditation. Um, now they're actually going to sleep a bit too. But like, I think they just try to attack it from their angle. And just unfortunately, the consumer marketing is like, meditate and your whole life will change, right? Like, I think reality is that like all these four things work better together. Right. So yeah. if you're working out and you, you know, eat properly, you're probably going to get better sleep. Right. And if you get better sleep and you're working on eating probably, you probably have the ability to focus and be a little bit more conscious. And, you know, if you were to meditate, probably get into a better meditation than the average person. Yeah. And so to me, I think the world of wellness is actually these things starting to work together more, like working more as a collective. I, I think they all help improve each other. And frankly, I think you need all of them to like really achieve your potential. I, I don't think it's any one leg. And, and I think it's a little unfortunate how the marketing side just pushes, typically these companies just push, you know, one angle of it, ourselves included, right? I was yeah. like, one of the things I was talking about, I was like, I think we need to work with other partners. I think we need to do more integrated stuff, right? Like I would love to do more stuff with a meditation company, right? And that's part of the reason we're doing this meditation mode with Oak, because like, one thing we do know about why do people most most people meditate it's actually because they have sleep issues right mm-hmm. and we do know that meditation actually helps improve the parasympathetic helps actually improve sleep yeah right so i think we'll start to see more partnerships evolving in the wellness space as a whole um hopefully in these four areas and even more uh, but i'll turn the question to you i mean you get mm-hmm. to talk to people all the time from different backgrounds right? you, have, you have paul check talking about water right sure, so, sure yeah. like what do you what do you think the wellness world is gonna turn out to be or where do you see it going well Thank you for asking me a question yeah. on, on the show. That's great. I think that we're in a massive state of, 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 of a huge up-leveling of consciousness. And I think we're seeing the clues everywhere. But sometimes the clues are like hiding in plain sight. Yeah. And people don't see them because it's something that's considered a platitude. I think that right now most people are finding their voice, whether they're an entrepreneur, whether they're a mom or dad, or just a parent, or just an everyday person. Yeah. And I think it's in the finding of our unique voice that we actually express what wellness is. And everybody's finding their own voice. And that voice is aligned with with, what they actually believe. What is the basement of truth that somebody believes? And are they willing to speak that truth into existence? They're going to be more well. That's what wellness is going to turn out to be. I love that. And I think that's going to change the world. And why do you, what do you think some of the blockers are? Like you were, we were talking about before. What do you think if you look at people's sort of the knowledge and then the actual actions, what do you think the missing gap is for a lot of people? The inability to acknowledge fear. It's the acknowledgement of fear. I guess, I guess guilt. Yeah. Sort of a same. You, sure. You, you don't acknowledge the guilt. And we all go yeah. through fear. Fear, yeah. is, fear is part of life. But is it rational fear or irrational fear? Yeah. Which one is it? So I love that you asked me a question. I, I appreciate you. I appreciate yeah, your sure. truth on this show. I, I love what you're doing. You know, Wellness Force is so stoked to support Aura and everything you guys represent. No, likewise. And, yeah. yeah. Like I'm, we're, we're excited to, frankly, like be on the show, talking to you. I think uh, all of our team, like obviously loves you and the work you do. And Again, I think I think of this like the education piece that you bring to the table, and frankly, what's cool about the podcasting, you know, and the content and and the education side is that you are bringing all four of these or five things of sure, you know, sort of wellness together. Um, and I think people need all of them, and I think people need education and to learn about all of them, right? Yeah. I, I think the one of the biggest missing links is sort of education. I, I do believe that if a lot of people had the knowledge, right, and then they had the tools, right, the data, right, that they could marry the two together. I completely agree. There's a lot of people who can see the data and know the knowledge and still can't make the action. Right, and, right. you know, even I myself struggle with that, right? So, um, and that that you just have to be willing to acknowledge the struggle and be willing to talk about it. I think you make a really good point. And once you start to acknowledge it, then you have a little bit less fear. Um, you know, I think it's fine to be afraid. I think it's fine to have guilt, right? Let's talk about Let's it. Let's talk about it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. um, but no, thank you for yeah. honestly doing everything you do. And it's uh, it, it's it's great. I think I think we're starting to see this consciousness side rise and you're seeing it in longer form content right i think 
I think the short form content you have, you know, people do it. We have all these messages on our our phones every day, so you got to compete for some mind share. But I think the whole movement towards, to me, you know, uninterrupted ad, you know, podcasts is amazing, right? The amount of knowledge and content that people are getting in a longer form again allows you to focus, allows you to be a little bit more conscious and actually think, right? Mm. Rather than just get a marketing spin from from a show. Yeah. And, and it leads when we face the fear and when we actually track what's going on, yeah. I think we're nine times out of 10 more likely to actually live a better life. And we're doing these things that are uncomfortable totally. and we have the tools to support us through that discomfort. Yeah. That's what this is all about. We appreciate your generosity too, because Aura is kind enough to give a ring to our audience. We're doing yeah. a giveaway this year. So go to Wellness Force 252 episode. You're two episode 252. Okay. Awesome. Congrats, so go to, yeah. go to Wellness Force 252. Uh, make sure you understand how easy it is to get involved. You can also get a big discount code. Yeah, $50 uh, off. $50 yeah. off with code Wellness Force. Thank you so much for your yeah. generosity. Thanks for Heartfree having me. Ride. Yeah. Appreciate you. Likewise. Thanks, Josh. All right, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Until then, I'm wishing you love and wellness. Hey, my friend. Thank you for hanging out and growing with me today. Everything you learned on this podcast starts with your morning practices. So from over 200 world-class guests and counting, we've distilled the gems, the best of the best science-backed practices down into a 21-minute morning system guaranteed to increase the positive flow in your day. Get this free and powerful 21-minute life-changing system over at wellnessforce.com forward slash m 21 If you enjoyed this episode, tap your phone, share it with someone you care about because that is how we all get better together. Supporting the show is easy. Leave us a five-star review right now from your phone. It helps us reach other smart and conscious people like you. Either tap your phone and hit the link in purple that says review this podcast or go to wellnessforce.com forward slash review. And this show doesn't stop here. We're continuing the discovering process in our private Facebook group. You can be a part of it. All you have to do is go to wellnessforce.com forward slash group and I'll welcome you at the door. Okay, now you get to go out into your world and live your life well. So until I see you again real soon, I'm wishing you love and wellness.